Hi, thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Nada Youssef, and you're listening to Health Essentials Podcast by Cleveland Clinic. Today, we're broadcasting from Cleveland Clinic main campus here in Cleveland, Ohio, and we're here with Dr. Scott Steele. Dr. Steele is the chairman of the Department of Colorectal Surgery here at Cleveland Clinic. Thank you so much for being here today. Glad to be here. Sure thing. So I want to kind of ask you uh, some questions before we start, just uh, icebreakers. Um, First of all, would you rather read a book or listen to it and why? Uh, I would say historically, I would rather uh, listen to a book because I got a lot going on. I like to multitask, but I I do enjoy reading books. And I would say I much more often read books than I listen to them. Do you have a favorite? That's a part of Uh, my favorite book of all time is still Killing Pablo. I just (laughs) I like uh, I like Mark Bowden. I like the way that he writes. And I for any of you Netflix people out there, the first two seasons of Narcos is Killing Pablo, the book uh, about that. And then the subsequent seasons go on. But it's a it's a great book. I just really enjoy it. Very interesting. I'll have to check it out. How about your favorite podcast? Ah, good question. So I would say that, uh, like children, I have uh, more than one podcast, and I love them equally. Mm-hmm. Uh, one is uh, Butts and Guts here at Cleveland Clinic, a Cleveland Clinic podcast where we just uh, kind of look at the digestive system and um, surgical system, uh, DDSI, from mouth to butt, as we say, mm-hmm. um, going through all the ones. And um, and then I also have another podcast that I do that's called Behind the Knife that I've been doing since March of 2015. And that's that's a little bit more doctor-facing, whereas Butts and Guts is a little bit more patient-facing. Oh, that's excellent. And you're the host of both of those? You're I am. a single host. Yeah. That's amazing. So in an alternate universe, if you weren't in medicine, what would you be doing besides a host of a podcast? You know, I would (laughs) love to say that I was a professional athlete, but uh, (laughs) uh, that uh, my talents did not take me there. Uh, I enjoy woodworking a little bit. Uh, Maybe I would like to get more involved in that or something where it could be just a little less, a little less stressful. Yeah, yeah. uh, That's what I'd probably do. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, let's start with um, we're talking about Crohn's and colitis. So let's talk about, first of all, the difference. What is Crohn's? What is colitis? So what I would say is that in order to understand that, you got to look at the 10,000 foot view and those go under what's called inflammatory bowel disease or IBD. Mm -hmm. And really when you talk about Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, you really have to think about there's actually a third one in there that doesn't maybe get enough uh, street cred out there and that's indeterminate colitis. And so there's about 15% of people that have uh, a little bit of a ties to both of them. They can't, we can't really determine one or the other. There's some major overall differences between one typically you see when we think about that, we think about the fact that it starts at the anus and works its way back for it and only is involved in the, the very, the hind gut, the colon, the rectum and the anus versus mm-hmm. Crohn's can occur from mouth all the way down to anus. Okay. Both of them can have extra intestinal manifestations, meaning that they can have things that go up on your skin or your liver or your eyes, stuff like that. Uh, and then Crohn's tends to fall within kind of three different phenotypes, the way it manifests itself. Crohn's will either be a stricturing type disease, it'll be a fistulizing disease, and for uh, people out there listening to the podcast that don't know a fistula, think about a tunnel, (laughs) something from one end to the other. Mm -hmm. Um, It's got an opening versus a sinus, which is like a cave. It's got one opening and it just ends blindly. Or it can be a phlegmonous disease, so that it's it's got these large inflammatory phlegmons, so stenotic fistulizing, or phlegmatous type disease. Ulcerative colitis, again, tends to be mucosally based and typically involved in the colon, the rectum, uh, and then, and so it's those, they're kind of under that umbrella of IBD, um, Mm -hmm. uh, but there's, there's overall, there's three of them, indeterminate with a little bit of on each side. Now, when you talk about UC, that's ulcerative colitis. Is there a difference between that and just colitis by itself? Yeah. So colitis is just a general term. Remember, you add itis to anything Mm -hmm. and you got inflammation. Okay. So, you (laughs) know, desk itis, inflammation of the desk. I mean, that's just the (laughs) the Latin term of what uh, itis is. And so... Um, so colitis, a general term, just means that the colon is inflamed. It can be from infectious type issues. Uh, you get a you eat a get a bad stomach bug, and your mm-hmm. colon gets inflamed. C difficile is a very classic one. Okay. Uh, ulcerative colitis is an actual disease entity in and of itself, of which uh, the colon be inflamed with a very typical manifestations of it is a part of it. So that's a true diagnosis versus the generalized term colitis. Okay. So can you have both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's? Ah, that's a great question. That goes back to that third one that I yeah. was saying. That's oh, okay. um, the, the short answer is no. Um, the longer answer is, is that there's definitely a spectrum, much more. We in medicine like to kind of make things in a nice tight little boxes. It helps our minds go into it. But in reality, there are those patients. We always say there's about 15% of patients that you may think have one disease that ultimately turns the other. The classic one being that 
patients get diagnosed with ulcerative colitis and they ultimately have Crohn's. Mm. And the way that that manifests in many cases, especially on the surgery side of the house, I'm a surgeon, mm -hmm. is they would get a surgical therapy for their bowels. For example, we take out their their abdominal colon, their rectum, and we make them a new rectum called a pouch. Mm -hmm. And then down the road, they may manifest with Crohn's disease. So there's a small chance of that. So they didn't, it's not like they caught Crohn's or right. something like, you know, right. you caught a flu bug out there. What it is is more they probably fell on that spectrum that they initially presented much more like you see, but kind of Crohn's was lurking. Right. And that's not a common, but it's also not an uncommon type, unheard of uh, sure. pathway. So between uh, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, it looks like location is is a is the difference the biggest difference right but what are some of the shared symptoms besides something like inflammation yeah so they both can get uh, problems associated with their gi tract so they can mm -hmm. get diarrhea they can get um, belly pains uh, the colon can be involved in both you can have crohn's colitis in both versus ulcerative colitis mm -hmm. you can have extra intestinal manifestations in both that they both have skin disease or maybe has some arthritis there's no question that between the two that there's certain extra intestinal manifestations that may occur with one of the two versus the other uh, ulcerative colitis and having primary sclerosis and cholangitis which is a inflammatory condition associated with the bile ducts in the liver for example just one but um, the major difference between the two is not only the extent of disease from mouth all the way down to anus with Crohn's versus just the colon and the rectum with ulcerative colitis but it also is the thickness of what affects the bowel mm. so for example if you think about the bowel wall, think about a Big Mac. You got the bun okay. and you got the muscle and you got the other bun and that muscle being the meat patty within that and you got two all beef patty special sauce, so just two so <laughs> deal. The bowel itself on a histological level has mucosa, submucosa, muscle, and then serosa, then adventitial tissue. So it's got layers to it. Mm. So ulcerative colitis just affects the most superficial layer. It's a mucosally based disease versus Crohn's disease can affect all layers of the bowel. So even though the bowel is very thin, yeah. if you feel it, yeah. Crohn's can go all the way through. And so that's a very classic one. And that's why in Crohn's disease, you get things like fistulas, because it can go all the mm. way through the bowel versus if you see a fistula in the setting of ulcerative colitis, you should think, God, does this person have Crohn's disease? Right, right. Okay, so let's explain what fistula is to yep. so those who don't know. So there's lots of different type of fistulas. When we talk about a fistula, again, it's just, it's it's a tunnel or a tract from something to something. Mm -hmm. Classically in uh, Crohn's disease, there's a couple of different type of fistulas. The first one is on the bowel and that would go to another organ. So an entero, meaning small bowel, to cutaneous to the skin. There's a connection between them. They drain bowel contents through there or an entrovaginal through the woman's vagina to the bladder, entrovesical fistula. Oh, wow. Their name between where they come from and where they originate to. And because Crohn's is primarily a bowel disease, right. the inflammation is in the bowel, that that second organ is oftentimes just a bystander, just happens to be there. Wow. So the fistula is a tunnel going from the pathologic bowel to the bystander disease and causing that. The other part of the fistula that we see very common, especially in Crohn's disease, understanding that the vast majority of fistulas of this type are just run-of-the-mill uh, luck, and that's perianal, so around your bottom, around your mm. anus. So you can get fistulas in these type of diseases that occur with both Crohn's disease, but the much more common thing is you could have a fistula associated with non-Crohn's that is just originating from the little glands down there that make mucus so that you get a little bit of grease when you gotta yeah. go to the bathroom okay. that come out and those glands can get infected just like a boil on your arm can right. get infected. Your glands down there can get infected and you can get a fistula and that's again a tract from the anus to the skin. Crohn's disease can get a lot of them and they can be big and windy and they yeah. can be pretty symptomatic to patients. I see, so let's talk about risk factors and if it's genetic. And I, if risk factors are the same for both Crohn's yeah. and Yeah. So it's it's very interesting. So uh, a very common disease process, and we're finding out more and more. And we know there are some genes that are associated with um, with the development of having inflammatory bowel disease. There's IBD genes, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the CARD15 gene, not too. There's there's a lot of different ones that are out there, but we don't really say that we can. And so patients can have a family history of it, okay. but it's not like Mendelian genetics. You know, your mom has brown eyes or and your dad does or if you have blue eyes somebody's both pairs got to have that so we right. don't pass it like that but there's for sure tendencies that occur within a family history that you can pass things along mm -hmm. there's been a lot of things that have been looked at in terms of what causes inflammatory bowel disease there's no question it's probably multifactorial okay. and it has some environmental factors 
where we live, where we're around. It's got some uh, things that we're exposed to within that environment. It's got some hereditary factors. We know there's certain classes of population where inflammatory bowel disease or Crohn's disease even is much higher. Mm -hmm. The classic one is the Ashkenazi Jewish population. Mm -hmm. um, the, the rate of having inflammatory bowel disease is higher in that population. Um, and then, you know, there's been even some thoughts about more and more emerging about the gut's microbiome, all the yeah. little bacteria that live in there. They're being blamed for everything these yeah, days. We're yeah. trying to find a link with them and that goes with Crohn's disease as well. And there's been even some uh, studies in the past that have suggested some bacteria that we're exposed to that may lead to that. What may happen is you got a bunch of different factors that come together and trip off this cascade of events that are in susceptible hosts. So for whatever reason, you may have a makeup, not saying you have Crohn's or, or yeah. ulcerative colitis, that have a makeup that causes you to have um, uh, be more susceptible to that. And then depending on kind of what you're made up of, what you're exposed to, and your family history of all goes into setting that off. So that's a long way to say lots of different things we don't exactly know, but I think that hopefully within going forward, we'll be able to kind of hone down on that even more. Okay, so let's talk about like diet a little bit. Is there Are there any kind of foods that can cause or trigger these kind of conditions? There's no real foods that are linked to necessarily saying that you're going to get inflammatory bowel disease. There's okay. definitely foods that you can get colitis from though, and that's just like, there is. yeah, yeah, you had a bad bug, right? You can okay. have, oh, I see and, what you're and saying. that's yeah. that. So yeah. again, going back to colitis being the inflammation associated with the gut that you can get bad diarrhea on, sure. or C. diff colitis. But there's definitely, if you're having an inflammatory uh, bowel disease patient, there's definitely trigger foods that will set off certain people, and that can uh, that can change within the person. You yourself may find yourself in a situation where you say secretly, God, I can't eat pepperoni because I know that my yeah. stomach gets my stomach upset. And somebody else may say, man, I can eat it raw, and it's, yeah. and it's not a problem. So foods within themselves act much more like triggers than anything else associated with, um, with the inflammatory bowel disease. So it just depends on who's susceptible to getting that kind of Yeah, thing. I would say that. Yeah. And what kind of demographic is mostly diagnosed with this disease? Well, um, you know, it's it can touch everyone. Um, there's no question. Like I talked about before, there's certain uh, ethnic groups that are much more um, in the classic one being the Ashkenazi Jews that I talked about before. Mm -hmm. um, it definitely can also run in families. We, we talk about a 15 to maybe 20 percent risk associated with having it run into families. Okay. Um, uh, Caucasian population for sure more there's um, but there's definitely there's Asians that can get it African Americans African I mean mm -hmm. it's it can be all over in mm -hmm. terms of that okay and so how do you diagnose um, Crohn's and colitis and what kind of tests need to be done so in general it's a clinical diagnosis there's not a blood test that you can run they've definitely had blood tests that we've used in the past mm -hmm. that are much more and there is still tests that are available out there that are called IBD panels that will run PNC or PSC they've done in the past. These are the names of the small tests that if they're positive in one light or other, or even have a particular pattern mm -hmm. that you may say you're more apt to not only have inflammatory bowel disease, but you could have Crohn's instead of ulcerative colitis for those patients that don't fit a particular diagnosis with everything that's in a way, shape or form. What I will tell you is the fact that we still look for kind of classic symptoms. So patients will present and they may have belly pain, or they may cause to have a belly obstruction, or they could have a multiple bleeding stools where they wouldn't have before. And the type of tests that we use uh, at our disposal are making sure first and foremost that we get a good physical exam. So we look for things like, um, like what's their belly like? Do they have fistulas that I talked about before? Um, radiographic tests are still a mainstay, things like a CAT scan, or there's special types of CAT scans or MRs that are called MR enterography or MRE or CT enterography that look closer at the bowel to see the degree of inflammation associated with the bowel. And then we also use endoscopy. So we can do scopes that look in the colon, your standard colonoscopy, or scopes that look down into the stomach. Okay. And we kind of put together this whole um, picture and based on all pieces of the pie and very quickly you can come up with a diagnosis so somebody who has then gets a scope gets biopsies and it looks like it's kind of a classic histological example of Crohn's in the setting of also having disease in the colon is also in the small bowel and they fit that type of image you're gonna say they got Crohn's disease and then they're treated as such so speaking of scopes um, there's 
I think three really main ones, right? There's a colonoscopy, endoscopy, and there's a sigmoidoscopy. Can you talk about the difference between those and what they are, just in case a patient is, you know, gets to hear that they have to get that done? Sure. So endoscopy is just a general term for meaning we're going to put a scope somewhere inside of you. Okay. And that can go into an orifice. So think about all the different orifices, that's endoscopy. So even an ENT scope can go look up in the nose or in the mouth, and they're technically doing endoscopy. Okay. Sigmoidoscopy and colonoscopy or esophagogastroduodenoscopy or EGD are all fancy words with the ending oscopy. So oscopy is you're looking at it. It's a yeah. scope you're going to look. And then what you're looking at is that prefix. So colonoscopy is a longer scope and it can look all the way around the colon. Remember the colon is about six feet long. Six feet. Yeah, it's about six feet wow. long, and some people have longer than others, but it's about six feet long. And so a colonoscopy, you attempt to look at the whole scope, and then in many cases what we can do is we can get through the little valve that connects your small bowel to your large bowel down by your appendix called your ileocecal valve, and we can get a sneak preview at the very end of your small bowel, which is called your terminal ileum. A flexible sigmoidoscopy is essentially a shorter scope that classically can only look for the left part of your colon, so your anus, your rectum, your sigmoid colon going backwards, and your descending colon. That's about 70 centimeters, and occasionally in, in certain people are easier to scope who don't have a big loopy sigmoid colon. You can actually even get up to the transverse colon in a lot of these people, but it's classically a left-sided scope. They're called flexible because you can move them, they're dilating them. There are such things called rigid scopes and in our case in the field of colorectal surgery we use a proctoscope which tends to be a rigid tube that you use handheld air to blow up the colon and get a good look at the mucosa so those things are things that can be done in an office a proctoscopy an anoscopy where you only look at the anus or the even a flexible sigmoidoscopy the colonoscopy in general even though i've definitely had patients and i myself when i had my colonoscope i tried to do it without medication i got about halfway around before i said give me the juice yeah. um, but most of the time you need to have a full bowel prep where you drink all the stuff go to the bathroom and then you uh, and then you get some sedation okay so this is what to expect you're gonna you're gonna have some kind of prep it's gonna cleanse your system yep right and then pretty painless with some drugs yeah, so that's a, so what I try to say, so, and this goes for all colonoscopy, for both colitis, IBD, ulcerative colitis, so if you're just in there for a routine colorectal cancer screening type full colonoscopy, probably the worst part of it still is the prep that you would take the night yeah. before and maybe the morning of, depending on what your doctor prescribes for you. It's a big jug, right? Well, there's a lot of different types of preps out there, and there's okay. pills and other things, and we're trying to get to the point where we get, but there's still, the vast majority of patients are going to drink stuff that's going to make you go to the bathroom, okay. and you're you're going to drink it in the beginning if you are one of the lucky few who get the big jug out there, and, uh, and you're not going to go right away, and then all of a sudden it's going to hit you, and you're going to spend yeah. some time in the bathroom. But it does, it does a wonderful job about cleaning out the bowel, and then it, so what people may not understand out there is the fact that the bowel itself it, even if you're somebody who goes to the bathroom a lot, we all carry a lot of uh, kind of waste stool in our colons and in our, in our, um, in our bodies, mm -hmm. and that cleans it out. And so the other thing is that the colon itself, by and large, is collapsed on itself. It's, uh, it's, a, it's got a lumen to it, though, just like a garden hose has a lumen to it, but the garden hose wall is stiff, your bowel is soft, mm -hmm. so it kind of collapses. So we use air to blow up the colon. So the other part of the endoscopy is we don't even we not only put in through the scope through, but we're also blowing in some air so we can open, so we can take a good look around and make sure that there's no pathology in there. Okay, great, wow, sounds interesting. Now, is there a cure? Well, for cure? ulcerative colitis, um, so let me just step back and I would say that in general, there is, just like there's a spectrum of diseases, there's also a spectrum in terms of how potent that particular person is, meaning that I definitely have had patients with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease that really, they're not that affected. And some patients can really, with really mild cases, they may be on minimal medications at all, or in some cases, they don't even take medications, they just kind of cure it with diet or do whatever. Sure. Not cure it with diet, but manage it with sure. diet. There's other patients that despite the strongest drugs that we do, and the strongest medications that we have, they still have complications associated mm -hmm. with it. And so if you, if you take a look within those, we know that there's different classes of medications as well as surgery that we use in order to control the disease and also control 
the manifestations of the disease, which could be complications associated sure. with the disease. Flares, things exactly. like that. So when is surgery needed? So, um, so in general, just to get back to the medications mm -hmm. and surgery, what we talk about is we talk about ulcerative colitis. You have a certain set of populations that may decide that they're going to be managed with medications only and they're successfully managed with that or they're not or mm -hmm. patients don't want to take the medications. Right. And so ulcerative colitis could be quote unquote cured by taking out all the affected bowel. Mm -hmm. So what we do in that case is the affected bowel for uh, ulcerative colitis is the rectum and the colon. We can remove that and patients in the old school could either get a permanent bag mm -hmm. or nowadays what we're able to do even through minimally invasive procedures is to be able to make some small incisions, remove the colon and the rectum and make them a new rectum using their small bowel called a pouch. And that pouch is con called a J pouch or an ileal pouch and there's different types of configurations but the most common, the workhorse one is the J pouch. Mm -hmm. And so patients theoretically can be cured of their disease with ulcerative colitis by doing this. Crohn's disease, again, thinking about not only the medications, there's different classifications for both of these diseases. So on the short end, there's things called amino salicylates, and then other people be, can be put on some of the biologics or the immunomodulators, and they've got all sorts of different names and, and ways that they work to affect our inflammatory system to try to quell that inflammation, and they can be adequately controlled. For Crohn's disease, it's a little bit different in terms of cure. It's hard to say that you can really cure Crohn's disease because mm -hmm. it can occurs from mouth yeah. to bottom. And there's not just a set area that we can cut out in that because the rest of the bowel could still be affected. Sure. And so in those cases, we typically operate in general for Crohn's disease for complications associated with disease. So patients who perforate, patients who have fistulas that need mm -hmm. to be taken care of, patients who get stricturing over time and get a bowel obstruction, or patients who continue to have problems associated with non-responsive to the medications that we need to go in there and take out that. So if with Crohn's disease, we don't necessarily say, hey, we're gonna take out all your colon and rectum and give you a new pouch because right. it can just occur again in the small bowel and you can be having problems associated with that. Sure. So we try to limit our surgery on the disease aspect of where it's causing patients to have problems. We talk about function as well. You always wanna consider, because you can't start just chopping away at the bowel or you'll be left with too short a bowel yeah. and patients won't digest well and they'll have a failure to thrive. So I was going to ask about that. So first of all, I want to clarify, J pouch, you said it, it's internal, right? I mean, it's literally you're making them. Yeah, thanks for giving me the opportunity to say that. So a lot of patients will oftentimes hear the term pouch and they'll think a bag yeah, and they'll think of ostomy. Bag. Yeah. Right. So when we talk about a stoma, so a stoma versus a bag versus a uh, ileostomy mm -hmm. versus a colostomy, all these different terms really are meaning the same thing. Mm -hmm. So a stoma is just, again, what we talked about endoscopy and flexible sigmoidoscopy and colonoscopy. What we talk about in stoma is opening. So your mouth is a stoma. Ah, mm -hmm. it's a, it means opening. But a stoma, when we think about it on the belly, is essentially an opening of the bowel to the skin. And ostomy is that art of bringing the bowel up to that. So an ileostomy is when we bring the ileum up. Okay. Which is the tail end of the small bowel. The colostomy is when we bring the colon up, and it's a colostomy that you have. And patients wear a bag so that the waste can go into the bag and they can live a completely normal functional life associated with that. A pouch, the way that I think about pouch and the way that we're describing it today, is constructing essentially a reservoir, a holding tank. Your rectum is just a holding tank for yeah. stool. I got, yeah. I got news for you, it's nothing fancy. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's an area where when stool goes down and reaches the rectum, you get the sense that you're like, uh-oh, I kinda gotta go to the bathroom, but your rectum expands mm. and allows you to have the ability to say, I'm gonna finish this interview and then go my deal, <laughs> instead of just right there. <laughs> and it allows you to essentially have that capacity to hold stool. The pouch that we make is essentially called a J pouch only because of the fact that we take the end of the small bowel and we bend it on itself in the configuration of a J. Mm -hmm. There's also an S pouch that we had one more turn to it. There's actually even a oh. W pouch that's been described, but the workhorse is still the J pouch that we use. And that is the bowel itself on the internal so people don't have to wear a permanent bag. As a matter of fact, there's different types of pouches that we make so that they don't have to do that. Wearing an ostomy or a bag on the outside is definitely a part of the process. And what I mean by that is the fact that if you had bad ulcerative colitis and you're on a bunch of different medications, oftentimes they get referred to us as surgeons because they're sick. 
And so we may do a multi-step procedure to get them to the point over months mm -hmm. to the point where they don't have to wear a bag. And so the first operation may be say, I'm going to remove all of your colon because that's pretty sick and bring a loop of bowel to the skin and ileostomy. The second type of the procedure a few months down the road is going to be, I'm going to take out that rectum. I'm going to make you that pouch, that new rectum with the small bowel and connect it down to the bottom, down to your anus. And again, I'm going to bring up a loop of bowel to the skin so that stool can be diverted so that pouch can heal. And then a couple of weeks down the road, I'm going to be able to take this down. So the fact that you wind up with no bags, but it's occurred over a few months sure. to get you to the point where you're there. Mm -hmm. And so patients can oftentimes get exactly like I wasn't super clear before with confused with the terms pouch versus bag yeah. versus ostomy versus everything. But um, we, there's even a type of pouch that we make here at the Cleveland Clinic. It's one of the few centers that do it that is called the K-pouch or cock pouch. Mm. And that type of pouch is a pouch that you also don't have to wear a bag, but it's for ones that we actually bring to the skin. And it's something that patients can, we make, it's kind of got a, a ball valve to it that we bring up to the skin and you intubate that with a tube. So you drain the waste and then patients can go about their lives and do whatever they want to do and not have to wear the external bag. Yeah. And then every so often they just go ahead and intubate the pouch. And again, we're one of the few centers in the world that do that. Is this something, if someone had the old style stoma bag can they get this new yeah, there's, pouch? there's a lot of considerations to it yep mm -hmm. and coke, coke pouch has been around a long time mm -hmm. um, and there's certain aspects where people would uh, would want or not be able to do it but it is definitely something that is in the armipotarium for what we have so what would you say to someone that has a stoma is a stoma bag is the one that would be an external bag correct, correct. Uh, for quality of life what kind of things should they be expecting what to do daily things like that so there's a difference between a colostomy and an ileostomy for sure mm -hmm. in general if you just think about the fact of digestion so when we eat kind of take a step back from the question to really kind of understand this when we eat the process of a digestion is we eat goes down our stomach our stomach starts to get, use the acid and then it gets the enzymes from our pancreas and our liver works its way through the small bowel where really it gets not only broken down but we get a lot of our nutrition that's absorbed and everything and your bowel actually secretes fluid in and also absorbs fluid out to the point where and when it goes through your jejunum which is several feet of jejunum and your ileum which is the tail end of the small bowel and comes all the way down here and most people down to their right lower quadrants where your appendix sits that stool when it reaches the colon is still kind of a thinner liquid mm -hmm. uh, maybe in the best of worlds it's maybe like uh, grits or something like that but by and large it's pretty liquidy You're your colon's job actually with the workhorse of it being the right side of the colon is to absorb water mm -hmm. and so then it absorbs water throughout the colon and by the time it gets to the left side it actually forms stool and so certain people maybe not for whatever reason maybe not as either efficient or that or they can't kind of form stool and they have looser stools and, and again the looseness of your stools or how many times you go is so individualized and there's Definitely, probably men go on more often than women, but right. there's so many things that are emotions, what we eat, the time of the day, your patterns that you fall into, go into how many bowel movements you have. It's a very common question that I get asked. Sure. Um, but to go back to the question you asked at hand, what to expect. So if you're somebody that is missing your colon, you gotta go back to what is what is natural. Mm -hmm. So if it's natural for you to typically have a little bit more liquidy stool, if you have an ileostomy, then mm -hmm. that stool that's gonna come in the bag tends to be a little bit more liquidier. Now over time, your small bowel gets much more efficient and you'll see it thicken up a little bit. And what patients notice with an ileostomy is the fact that oftentimes, no matter what they, or depending on what they eat, or sometimes we put them on bowel slowing medications or bulking agents like fiber, Metamucil, Consul, Citrusil, some of these other things, or bowel slowing medications, Imodium, Lomodal, some of these other ones that will thicken it up so it gets to be a little bit thicker. It mm -hmm. also helps the fact so you don't get dehydrated. Mm -hmm. If you have a colostomy, you got all your colon in your play or for people that have part of their colon removed, some of your colon in play to the point where your colon still has the ability to do its job. So for people who have a colostomy, they may just like they have a bowel movement, the, what comes out of their colon may be, not be as often and it may be thicker stool. And so I have definitely have patients with a colostomy that can almost train themselves over years to have a bowel movement just through that. And sometimes they wear a bag and, and they've got a small amount of patients that actually don't even wear a bag. They've been able to do, do that. But it goes back to the anatomy and the physiology of how we're wired such that you could say that what to expect is much different from somebody who has a colon that's to the skin versus mm -hmm. an ileum that's to the skin. Okay. The one point that I would like to make sure that patients, especially patients that are faced with the 
recent being told that, hey, you know, if you go through this, you could wear a bag and the yeah. bag could be permanent. That's not only something that is body altering, but it's mind altering. Can you imagine if I told you right now, I don't know you, I'm assuming you don't have a bag, but if I told you right now and I said, listen, I, wh whatever's going on with you, you're gonna have to wear a permanent bag. That's a shock to most people's yeah. systems. Yeah. And one of the first things they say, and a very common thing that I think is, oh my God, I'd rather die. My own mom said this when mm -hmm. she was faced with her terminal illness. She would say, I'd rather die, Scott, than get with it. And then it kind of sits in. And what most people find after they go through is, in many cases, their quality of life was better than it was before. Mm -hmm. And you can do everything. I have buddies that have climbed mountains, done Ironmans, right. done just about you name it. I have somebody that fashioned this wonderful uh, padding apparatus so she could still play rugby um, using a bag. And you find that not only can you do everything that you want to do, but you can continue to have that solid quality of life. And in some cases, patients have been trying to avoid a bag or avoid an operation that had the threat of having a bag for far too long where they lost their quality of life. And it's yeah. not an uncommon finding that they come back to me in a post-operative setting and say, God, I wish I would have got this thing a long time ago because um, I would have been I, I've been suffering for a long time. Good, good. I'm glad I'm glad you touched on that. I think it's very important. So let's talk about some lifestyle changes for uh, people with Crohn's and colitis from stress management, exercise. I know we talked about diet, but if there's any kind of food that triggers or anything like that, um, what is what is the ideal lifestyle? So uh, what I would say is that I would hope that for most people that they would have a very normal lifestyle, that they mm -hmm. would fall into a pattern. They could be either uh, taking care of any complications that they might have with medications or even with surgery to get back them to doing everything that they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. There's no question though that there is, uh, there are certain foods that trigger and the foods like we talked about before that may trigger one Crohn's or ulcerative colitis patient may not be other ones. There's definitely diets, elemental diets or other diets, especially in kids, specialized diets that they may do that, um, that are out there that certain GI doctors use that could, uh, for the severest of Crohn's patients will still allow them to get to be able to take in uh, nutrition through the mouth and, and get, you know, have weight gain, not have weight loss and be nutritionally uh, replete. Um, but in terms of being able to exercise and be able to do all the things you want to do, there's really nothing that they can hold them all the way back from doing that. During a flare, there's no question that patients can have, they can be sick yeah. and, and depending on the degree and kind of potency of that flare and where it affects, especially with how that flare is. So is it bloody diarrhea that won't come down? Is it abdominal pain that just is occurring? Is it a bowel obstruction that can come up or is it a fistula that has reared its ugly head? Mm -hmm. So depending on what's going on with that patient may affect that time that may have to be taken care of with either medications and admission to the hospital, going on IV nutrition during that time, mm -hmm. or even surgery that we have to think about. But in general, I guess the biggest take home message to answer your question is their quality of life, the things that they do, the exercise, and hopefully even some of the diets that they eat, mm -hmm. if their their disease is well controlled, can be as normal for them as for anybody else. That's great, excellent. And I wanna go back to the microbiome. I know you were talking about like the gut germs. Mm -hmm. um, are any changes in the microbiome in your gut, would that change things for Crohn's and colitis? Well, I think that's what's going to be the next rise. And as a matter of fact, I know that us, like other institutions, are collecting stool samples and yeah. getting biopsies and stuff and really studying the role of microbiome for inflammatory bowel disease. And, you know, there's some preliminary reports that have some suggestions. We're not there yet, okay. but I do think that's the next thing on the horizon. Just like it's the next thing on the horizon in terms of healing when we uh, put bowel specimens back together, when we cut out a piece of bowel and link them up and whether or not that leaks. John Alverde at the University of Chicago has done a lot of work in this. Um, cancer uh, operations, Matt Clady here uh, in my department is an NIH funded researcher that's looking at the role of the microbiome. We have a lot of different things uh, and I know that our GI department led by Dr. Miguel Ruggiero, who's our chair here and others within, uh, within the DDSI are taking a look at the role of the microbiome mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, what it does, not only in terms of causation, but treatments right. and then also things like flares and how we can affect it. Great. Now I want to talk about with Crohn's and colitis, do they have patients, do they have an increased risk for colorectal cancer? Yeah. Should they get their colonoscopies earlier? Absolutely. So in general, what we talked about in the past is it used to be thought, if you go back 20 years, that maybe it was just ulcerative colitis that, mm -hmm. uh, that was associated with increased risk. And what we found through the thing is that inflammatory bowel disease does have a higher risk in general than the general population. Really, when you break that down further, if you can take a look, especially it goes to colorectal cancer, there's two things that we think of. 
The first one is the length of time that you've had it. So meaning that if you've had it for a long time, that's had that inflammation, which is one of the potential things that can cause the cells to go awry and ultimately trigger on a, uh, a, a, a tend towards having either dysplasia, which mm -hmm. is the cells look funny underneath the microscope. It's along the pathway to cancer versus um, uh, also the degree of how much of the bowel is affected. Mm -hmm. So if you've had it longer or it, your gut is more affected, a pan colitis instead of just maybe a part of your colon, those patients that have had it longer and they're more their colon is affected are at a higher risk. Mm -hmm. And that is for both Crohn's and for ulcerative colitis. The one thing that I will also say about that is the traditional pathway to having cancer in non-IBD patients has a pretty set pathway where you go through a polyp, the polyp becomes dysplastic, the dysplasia goes along, and then ultimately you get a, a cancer. There's other types of polyps that have different pathways, and you know it, whether it's BRAF or serrated polyposis or all these fancy doctor terms, you gotta think about it. You're starting with somebody that's nor something that's normal, and you're going to something that's abnormal and ultimately invading into the bowel, and that's the diagnosis of cancer. IBD pathway can be different pathway, mm -hmm. and that pathway is outside of the traditional pathway of the adenoma to carcinoma sequence. So not only is it uh, an important that we control their inflammation, but that we also follow them to be able to say that we want to follow you at a more uh, frequent interval yeah. to make sure that you don't have cancer because there's a higher risk than the general population. Sure, sure. great. And, um, Last question for you. Yeah. I want to talk about when it comes to pregnancy for women, because um, I have a lot of friends that are childbearing age, yeah. and some do have uh, UC. And um, I just wonder, is it hard for women to get pregnant? And if they do, what does that mean for the baby? Do they go through intermission during, or what's going on with that? Yeah, so this is a whole, I think that it's it's been around, it's been uh, something that's been known for a long time, that there's no question that you know some of the inflammatory things, including inflammatory bowel disease, affect uh, uh, women's ability to get pregnant mm -hmm. um, it but it's not talked about a whole lot and we don't you know to know exactly what degree I know that there's multidisciplinary clinics that are taking a look at that I will say this falls into two different patterns the first one that you have to think about is you have to think about the fact that what is going on in terms of the overall system that might be affecting their ability to get pregnant and the second part is is there any aspect in terms of some of the things we do to them as surgeons mm -hmm. or even the medications that may affect that? And I think the medications, the aspect of that, especially with some of the newer biologics, remains to be seen. Okay. And that's something that with time we'll be able to know that maybe there are certain medications that make it more difficult than others. But I can tell you from a surgical standpoint is that any pelvic operation that we do, including one of the ones for ulcerative colitis, has the potential to form scar tissue. Mm -hmm. And uh, the woman's ovaries and their fallopian tubes are sitting right down in that area. Mm -hmm. And so there's been times in the past where we've had people come in and pexy their, uh, their fallopian tubes up so to kind of get them out of the pelvis mm -hmm. or even wrap the, um, the, at the time of the operation, wrap the fallopian tubes in some anti-adhesive type things. And people have tried a lot of different things to try to minimize that scar tissue. Probably one of the best thing that's come along is having minimally invasive surgery. Some, some of the minimally invasive surgery that we do, uh, like here at the clinic, allows you to have less scar tissue, which then will have that secondary scar tissue, hopefully not there, mm. towards where a woman's fallopian tubes and the ovaries are so that it increases the chances to get pregnant. The second part of that question is, is that oftentimes, for example, let's use a situation where somebody had their rectum and their colon removed, they had a pouch, now they get pregnant, which is absolutely possible. I've had many women do that. Yeah. And uh, how do we, is that a high risk pregnancy? And in many cases that is considered a high risk pregnancy. And then it goes through the whole process of should they have a C-section or can they have a normal vaginal birth? And those are some of the questions that we kind of go through and with our, you know, with our, uh, our uh, perioperative and our gynecology people to kind of discuss, because that's definitely some things that we need to think about. Sure. Sure. Wow. Well, we're out of time, and that was a lot of information. Thank well, you so much. Thanks for having me here. Sure thing. Thank you so much. And please remember, this is for informational purposes only, and it's not intended to replace your own physician's advice. And for more information on these topics and other digestive and surgical topics, download the Butts and Guts podcast by visiting clevelandclinic.org slash guts. And to make an appointment with a Cleveland Clinic digestive specialist, please call 216-444-7000. And for more health tips and information, make sure you're following us on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Cleveland Clinic, just one word. We'll see you again next time.